So that was Amina Menina, which <laughs> I just, I sound <laughs> ridiculous. I just, I'm laughing at myself trying to pronounce this. Um, so that was the second track off of the debut album from Uj Mutantes, which comes in at number 75 on our list in the 1960s. It was ranked number 13 in 1968 and 646 overall. The debut album was released in June of 1968, and the recording of the album occurred between December 1967 and January 1968. The album has also received, I saw some other charts that it made, um, that it, 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 did, it does have a lot of worldwide acclaim. And some of the other lists that I found that it made were number 12 on Mojo's list of the best quote-unquote out there albums. It is number nine on it's got, Rolling Stone's got several rankings of this. It's number nine on their top 100 Brazilian albums of all time. Number 39 on their list of top 40 stoner albums and number 10 on their top on their top 10 greatest Latin albums. So Rolling Stone um, throws this into a bunch of categories, which probably rightfully so, because this album is all over the place. It is out there. It is certainly out there. So I think. Really, I mean, it's it's three band members, so we can just do some basic things. They were formed in 1966, and did you say? I, I'm sorry, did yeah. you say three band members? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just three. Wow. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, the core of the core of the band, right? So they also, I mean, the recording of this, they had other musicians and some help, like you know, a lot of people do. But yes, the the core of this band: three musicians, two brothers, Sergio Diaz Baptista who was the lead singer and also played guitar, and his brother Arn Arnaldo Baptista, who played keyboards and bass. And then there was the female uh, singer, vocalist, uh, recorder, player, percussionist, Rita Lee. And they were formed in 1966. And really, I have more information. There's a fascinating amount of information that I discovered in, you know, about this band. And mostly it was related to the Tropicalia artistic movement that lasted from 1964 to 1968, because that's what really what this band was as a part of the Tropicalia uh, movement in Brazil. Have either of you guys heard of this band or the Tropicalia music, musical or artistic movement, I should say, in Brazil? Nope. Band? No. Tropicalia uh... – in terms of because it was a political movement too so right. the tropicalia political movement dissident movement a whole lot okay us uh, oh, oosh mutantes zippo percent gotcha josh no i haven't heard of nothing it. yeah i that just was... assumed it was some type of musical genre or something but yeah, yeah history dork me is going to be helpful here music dork me is going to be totally non-helpful well the the history stuff is is as important, I would say, uh, to the mu as as the musical stuff, um, and I learned all about this. So I knew I knew nothing about this stuff. So this was when John last week you were, you, you mentioned that I would have to be doing my homework. You weren't kidding. Mm -hmm. um, so it really the whole movement started as a result of the disapproval of the military coup that occurred on March thirty first and April first, nineteen sixty four. Brazil was essentially in a kind of more of a democratic socialist uh, government. And there was concern that they were going down the road to communism. And this is going, you know, you're talking the mid, mid 60s, early mid 60s, that, um, you know, JFK and other other capitalist societies were very concerned about, you know, uh, other countries going communist. And so the, there was a military coup that was actually backed by, of course, the U.S. government, including both JFK and his brother Robert F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, who provided support for this coup. So the music and the artistic movement of Tropicalia was um, a direct result of this uh, military coup. They were very critical of this military authoritarian government that really clamped down on a lot of, um, you know, different freedoms throughout the country. And artists in Tropicalia became, you know, one of the main targets of the government. They were very, you know, vigilant about watching over these artists. And many artists had to submit their songs and their lyrics and their song titles to the government to be sanctioned, to be able to be released. So a lot of times the government would actually either cut type, cut, you know, lyrics or, you know, verses out outright or they would have them, you know, uh, re, you know, uh, rework them to be more palatable to the government. So that part, it, there's a, and there's a ton of information on, on all of that, but that's essentially where it started. And so the, the, 
the Tropicalia movement was really started by two main uh, main people, and it was uh, it was something that not only was going against the the government at the time, but it was also uh, you know up going after the left wing aspects of the of the country as well because those people were kind of more about traditional brazilian music they did not like the the influence of american and british music at the time rock and roll psychedelic music they felt it was you know it was they didn't like the commercialization of it they didn't like the mass you know popularity and they wanted their music to stay strictly Brazilian. So the Tropicalia movement was really in the smack dab in the middle of both of those different um, of those entities. And so they were getting resistance both from the right and the left. Um, so and I can also say that one of the main influences of the Tropicalia movement with the music, could you guys guess which 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 uh, which artist was very influential on this entire movement? I'm because of the running joke. I'm going to guess it's the Beatles. Of course, so that it's would the Beatles. Of course, it is. <laughs> but that would completely contradict what you just said about the movement wanting to go away from like Anglo ideas. And there's no, 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 no. no they dudes. they didn't want to go away from Anglo ideals. The people on the left, the the left wing Marxists, did. Oh, Who, gotcha, so gotcha, Tropicalia gotcha. movement okay. was quite. A, they embraced that. That uh, if I if I led you to believe that that was my mistake. No, the Tropicalia movement was very much influenced by. American and British rock and roll psychedelic music, and the two main, um, you know, biggest names that were associated with with creating this were Katay. I'm going to butcher this as well. Caetano Veloso and Gilberto Gill. So those are the two Ooh. main guys that really wanted to merge both the avant garde and more of the commercial, commercially successful music, which is after reading that is is not hard to you know see where that's coming from after listening to the music. So they really wanted to inf they they took essentially you know they took the idea of tr of um, cultural cannibalism that was another term I, I came up with here which was the idea that you're really trying to merge all kinds of different cultures together so they really wanted to take Brazilian bossa nova and samba music and put it together with psychedelic rock um, that was happening at the time and that's really what this album um, epitomizes I think and 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 Uj mutantes were probably one of if not the biggest rock and roll uh act out of brazil that brazil really might have ever had um so you know so that's kind of a little bit of the history of it there's some there's more you know information to go on this but it, it, that there's a whole list there's a whole number of things to learn about tropicalia and i actually was put in touch with through a friend of mine uh, my friend don um put me in touch with the head of the uh the professor and chair of the portuguese department at umass dartmouth uh who, who was <laughs> oh going you really did decide <laughs> okay i've just done too many beetles and birds albums. i'm telling you man i it, well this kind of just fell in my lap i'd like to take credit for it but it just uh, happens that this that the portuguese you know there, there's a there's a large portuguese population in southern Massachusetts and you know my, my in-laws live in that area so I've kind of have been exposed somewhat to this but uh but yeah I, I was speaking with Dario Borim who's this professor at UMass Dartmouth with some articles that he wrote about this stuff and guys I felt really dumb reading that stuff because that, <laughs> I had spent a while since I read like a heavy, there was a heavily academic article about this musical movement and the band in general. I got a lot of stuff out of it, but there was a lot of stuff that I missed too. So, um, but it was also very helpful because um, there's just a, a wealth of information here. So, but enough about kind of what the history of tropicalism is. Uh, what did you guys think of this record? Uh, let's start with you, John. It's a really interesting album. Um, it's the first album that we've done that I don't know if I would say I like it or I dislike it. It's it's extremely eclectic. It is definitely psychedelic. Um, it's shocking that the, there has to be more than three people playing on songs because there's a lot going on in different songs. It it in many ways it sounds as you said like the Beatles meeting psychedelic rock meeting world music would be the best way that I would describe mm -hmm. it. Cause it is, it is distinctly identifiable as Latin. It is distinctly identifiable as psychedelic and it has some of the structures of this would have been I'm trying to think of the corollary album that the Beatles would have been releasing at this time. Uh, but it, it sounds a, a lot like what the Beatles were doing with Sergeant Pepper 
Um, well, 68, uh, this would have been probably, this was after Sergeant Pepper. This probably would have been more around the white album. So, so I'm going to probably maybe in between have, somewhere. Yeah. I have to guess that this was influenced a little bit by Sergeant Pepper. If the Beatles were an influence. Cause th- I mean, that's, it's different, but that's, if you take the Beatles part of it, that's the Beatles that to me, this most recalls, but v- very, very, very interesting album. Not surprising. It's a part of the Tropicalia, um, Mm-hmm. movement right. uh because I, I i was able to identify brazilian band 1968 history me says okay um after the coup you know what i mean this this clearly seems reactionary i don't speak portuguese so the lyrics i i don't know much about um what the songs are i know that the, when i saw the first song too quickly i thought it said penis circumcision <laughs> <laughs> it looks very similar <laughs> So I, 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 I'm sure it means nothing of that. But if you go to Spotify, uh, I'll warn you in advance. It definitely looks like the first song is called Penis Circumcision. So <laughs> there, but but um, I, I, I have to defer to you guys because on this one, it's the first album where I don't have a hard take in any direction. Mm, okay. Josh? I was a little mixed on this album. I think they... I liked some of the the poppier, catchier aspects of some of the of the songs, like "I'm Minha Menina" and "Bat Macumba." I liked and "Adeus Maria Fulo," mm-hmm. um, but sometimes I felt like well, it also it also reminded me of the United States of America album a little bit in terms of that experimentation with sound and uh, that first song has some collage type uh sound effects and combination of um music um but then they then they kind of veer into they also had that circus carnival sounds which you know i hate (laughs) um and uh i I feel like so matt with the tropicali movement in terms of the music it doesn't necessarily have to be like political though right because um a lot of it was political, but in one way, shape or form. Right. So it wasn't necessarily political in always railing against, you know, the authoritarian government or something like, you know, a lot of times today, political music is about maybe human rights or, you know, or yeah. that type of thing. It was it was more about um, there there was an ant there. Was, it's, it's kind of interesting because it's a little all over the place. I mean, one of the songs on here, Oh, 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 yeah, the clock. Um, I think. Yeah, the watch is the, the watch. Cl- yep. the, watch. the watch. Okay. So that song is about really. It, it's 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 a song essentially about someone you know diving into into the ocean with a really expensive watch, and as they go deeper, the watch becomes useless, right? But it's got all these rubies and jewels and things like that. It's really nice, but at the end of the day, what's that really worth? If it doesn't do its mm-hmm. job, who cares, right? So, yeah. you know, so there's some things. Uh, there, there's some you know uh, critique about that, but certainly critique about you know the government as well. So it, it is very can, political in one way, shape, or form, you know, but, and the, but the topics can vary. So well, can I, I was go gonna, ahead, Josh, I'm sorry. I, I asked that because it seemed like, cause I looked up the lyric translations on some of these songs and they don't seem too complicated and they didn't mm-hmm. seem especially political. It was more like this woman is pretty or I'm sad or, you know, kind of more broad theme things. But I guess maybe I didn't, maybe there's deeper meanings there or like kind of, if to the casual listener, maybe that was intentional to like make it just seem like that, but they're really commenting on something well, else. Well, I do know that a lot of their stuff, and not just on this album, but they had plenty of albums after this. They a lot of their stuff was kind of tongue in cheek. It was a lot of making fun of you know yes. regular you know traditional culture. So it might not have been an overt kind of you know hey this is wrong or this is dumb, but it's it's almost like kind of painting a picture of like of what society's like and then kind of poking holes through that or making snide comments about it. So I and- I didn't do a lot of the re- the the translation. I didn't go that deep. You know that's an extra layer of of, of lyrics guy uh, that I just didn't do. But um but I but I did read that a lot of the stuff was was very tongue-in-cheek can i um say something that may be totally wrong but just might it's amusing i have kind of i know for example that brazilian music and brazilian football or soccer the idea in both of the concepts and when i say music i mean sort of more traditional brazilian music is the idea that it isn't just about doing culturally the the act it's also about how you do it the the beauty and the aesthetic Mm -hmm. of it Right. And and I wonder, you know, and I know about the Tropicalia movement. It seems like it was 
and, and from what I remember, it's in between two worlds, right? Like a left wing that wants to stay very much like um, almost like a, like a Venezuela of today, right? You know what I mean? Like nationalistic in its own sense, but sort of from the left and then like an authoritarian regime, almost of like Brazil today, mm -hmm. right? And then kind of in the middle, you know, sort of a more internationalist approach, right? Right. But I would imagine that that it, it kind of is like that you'll hear often that, you know, in with Brazilian soccer, it, it's it isn't even just about winning. Sometimes it's about like, did you win pretty? Like when Brazil won in 1994, people were happy, but they were like, ah, the team just was not an aesthetically beautiful team. Mm -hmm. So they can't they can't be great like the 1982 Brazilian team who lost this close game but played these beautiful free-flowing games and i wonder if that's a little bit like the song lyrics you mentioned really tie into that like a beautiful watch but a beautiful watch that doesn't have any function you know what i mean right what does what does what, you know it's kind of the opposite of that like what does it mean does it still have meaning so yeah i could be totally wrong but just an idea no i i didn't come across anything that like that specific well maybe i did in the article that, <laughs> that i wrote that i read that just went over my head um in parts but uh that that doesn't surprise me at all and i think that that i you know they're very conscious about all of those things right and this you know it's as for me i i really like this album in terms of this this is this is just a fascinating fascinating album to me it's there's nothing i've never heard anything really quite like it and it's it, it there's just influences and in, in they're they're just picking so many different genres and and cultural you know uh type sounds you know from all over the world really you know there's like there's that song it, it, josh you mentioned adeus maria fulo that sounds mm -hmm. i mean there's a lot of african drum it sounds like you're in the jungle you know what i mean and it's and it's it, it yeah. and there's nature sounds in that yeah and actually did i i I, it didn't say it on Wikipedia, but I think I might have heard an electric jug in there. So, oh my god! <laughs> which, but, um, <laughs> but there's something in there that if it's not the electric jug, it sounds something very similar to that. But they say in trauma, they do have callbacks, Matt. So. Yeah. That, <laughs> uh, so I think I don't know. I just I I thought this was a, just a really interesting album. I, I I liked a lot of it. There's actually a um the eight the what is it the the tenth track, "Tempo No Tempo," is actually a cover of the Mamas and the Papa song. Once I once once was a time I thought, which was a song I had never heard of, um, and yeah, I just I really dug where this was going. Now I can't say that this is something that I'm just going to be popping on left and right, but I I just loved how they layered, you know more of a psychedelic fuzz rock kind of sound with more of like a, you know, a samba acoustic guitar, you know, uh, like they did on, on, on uh, a Mania Menina. So yeah, this was just a very, I think this is very cool. And even if it's something I'm not going to listen to left and right, I'm going to, I, I definitely would not mind listening to this more and, and maybe even getting more into other artists that were in Tropicalia itself. I liked like I said, I like parts of this album, but I can hear that tongue in cheek aspect that you're, you uh, were speaking of when I was listening to this album. And I feel like sometimes they, they crossed the line, imaginary line in my head where it became like too silly, either like mm -hmm. with the sounds or, or just kind of like the, maybe the lightheartedness of the music or something. Um, I, that's kind of abstract, but um, I could feel that, and that's kind of where the album loses me at times. Did you? I, I think I. Did you ever feel that? Because because I'm just thinking right now. Even though you're looking at all these different you know sounds, you got African drums, you've got Brazilian samba, you've got you know psychedelic rock, you've got blues. There's jazz in here, right? There's like a New Orleans. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, street band in here. That's, you know, it's like a Cajun, Cajun band kind of a thing that you hear at, um, you know, sometime around, uh, uh, what is it, Mardi Gras, right? But I felt that a lot of this stuff, even though it was kind of all over the place, it still, they did something that I think it fit really well together. And I didn't feel like anything was terribly out of place. Do you guys feel, did you feel that? I, I, I did feel it was disjointed. You I'll did? be very okay. honest with you. Yeah, I, I, I like, for, for reference of personal preference, okay? I, tend to very much like Latin music and I hate to generalize such a large areas, South America, Latin America, all the same. Right. But, you know, if we go off the idea that Latin music has a lot of percussion rhythms, different instrumentation, I am a fan. Okay. Especially of uh, South American music. I thought in, 
I've also, Josh last week kind of came out and said, you know, I just don't know if I feel the birds, right? We kind of challenged that. I feel that way a little bit with psychedelic music in some ways. I just, I, I love the United States of America album, but I didn't really consider that to be a truly psychedelic album in terms of the sound. It was experimental, but to me, it, it was a lot more like art rock and a lot more ambient at times. Mm. And, you know, as opposed to like the 13th floor elevators or you know, this album, to me, this was very much a psychedelic album. So I liked some of the musicianship, but, but it never, it never became an album to me that was anything but a psychedelic album primarily, which was disappointing huh. because unlike Santana, for example, that we covered, I, I couldn't go between different things. It just always, as Josh said, it, there was like a level of absurdism to it kind of that, Josh talked about crossing the line, which I think is a good way to put it. it. I appreciated what they were going for, and and I'm happy I listened to it. But it it didn't it. While I can't give it a yay or a nay, and I would definitely say to listen to it, like this is not going to be one I'm going to revisit. It doesn't have any of the touch points of anything that I would revisit. Right. Yeah. Sometimes they change. They even like change styles like mid song. Yeah, I felt. Um, and so maybe it's just harder. And also I was thinking about this, you know, we, I rarely listen to music where I don't know the language that it's in. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking maybe something's being lost in translation that way too, but I couldn't really get a grasp on this album because I feel like, or not, not get a grasp. I couldn't understand what the, who this band was based on this album, um, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. No. Well, it's a, de it's a debut album too, right? So probably yeah. they were trying to find their own feel. Yeah. And they did several albums after this. They, you know, the, the story is that eventually Rita Lee um, and one of the brothers, uh, Arnaldo left the band to pursue solo careers. And, but Sergio kept the band going. They dissolved in 1978, but then they came back together in 2006, and they're actually still touring today. And uh, wow. well, not right now because of you know COVID, but they're you know, but they're still around. And the you know, my friends that I you know that I spoke with about this um, had saw them in 2012. So um, and they're touring like, and they've got a number of different um, artists that they have influenced. One of them actually said, when you first hear their music, it attacks your immune system until you are completely at their mercy. For years, it was pretty much the only thing I listened to. And that was Beck. He is a huge fan of, of Uj Mutantes, and he actually wrote a song. An album. Oh, yeah. Mut yeah, mutation, yeah. Mutations. Mutations, his second right? Album, yeah. Or, yeah, maybe that was his third album. But that has a song called Tropicalia on it, which is, it sounds very much like a song that could have come off of this um, or another. It's so know. funny that you mentioned that because I, I own that album and I never put two and two together as yeah. you were talking about it, but you're 100% right. That song sounds like it could be not maybe not on this album, but of the exact same genre. Yes. So fascinating. Yep. <laughs> other artists that have pl pledged their allegiance to Uj Mutantes include David Byrne, which is no mm -hmm. surprise really there at all. Yeah, no surprise there. Kurt Cobain who wrote a letter to Arnaldo Baptista in 1993 asking the band, pleading them to get back together to tour. So Kurt Cobain, uh, that didn't happen at that time. I don't know, you know if that really, how much that I weighed know, on, on Cobain. But. I know Nirvana is ridiculously popular in Brazil to this day. Hmm. So, yeah. So Flea, Devendra Banhart, and Of Montreal, they are all big fans of, of okay. Uj Mutantes as well. But I see what you guys are saying, and I think that this is something – at least for me, this is not something you can just put on once or twice and feel like you have a good grasp of. This is something that you're going to need to listen to multiple times, which I did. And I never got to, I don't love this album. So I don't want to come out and say like, this is the, one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. I am just, I am fascinated by how they put all of this stuff together, how it's just so different. Right. But it's got, but it's got enough things in there to keep me going. There's enough hooks. Um, there's enough melody. There's some great harmonies in here that they're doing. Do you, mm -hmm. do you think Matt, you'd like this album as much if you didn't cover it? Because I know that you more than any of us, like when you deep delve into something, you own it. You know what I mean? And so I wonder if Josh and I were presenting it, do you think you'd like it just as much? It's, it's, it's possible. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that I, I need to do the deep, 
delve, though that does help. I'm going back thinking about my reaction to the pretty things because I didn't cover that, but I liked it so much that I wanted to learn more about it. And so it's hard for me to say, would I have gotten to that point with this album? I definitely like the pretty things album better than this. So that's possible. But I also think that it's, it struck me right away. And so I would have listened to this multiple times anyway. So maybe a little bit, but I don't think it, I don't think it's carrying me over from like, a, I don't know how I feel about this to, wow, this is really cool. Um, I, I don't know if I could say that for sure, but um, I, yeah, I, I think this is something that at least for me, it demands multiple listens. And if you're somebody that needs something to, to, to grasp onto right away and to get really into it, because I know, I've, I know some people that say, I don't want to, I don't want my music to be homework. I just want to listen to it and enjoy it. Right. So for someone like that, maybe this is a little out there enough for you not to want to do that. If you're listening to this podcast, do you really believe that? Like this, this whole thing is the idea of listening to music you like, but also pushing your boundaries. Yeah. So right? probably not. So, so probably people who are listening to this gotten this far will probably, yeah, I would recommend it for sure. It's, it's, it's unique if anything else. And it's, and it's not like, to me, it's not like an Eric Dolphy unique where it's, it's like, I can't listen to this. It's, there's nothing I found pleasurable about that. There's, there's plenty of things that I liked about this. Um, mm. And I think that, I think that a lot of other rock, you know, pop, uh, you know, uh, oriented fans would like as well. So um, yeah. Do you think this album belongs on the list? Um, that's a. <laughs> I I I don't have a problem with it being on this list. I can say that. I I think that there was there's enough. Rever- See, a lot of this is has for me has to do with influence and like other artists really you know that it that it meaning meaning something for other artists and having some sort of influence. I I think that there's enough respect here that I've read about other artists really getting into this. And, and how different it was and how unique and how it blended all these things. So I don't have a problem because of that, right? I might have more of an right. issue with something that's a little bit – like maybe the David Bowie of, of a recent album that we had recently, which is like we kind of talked about maybe that's on here because it's David Bowie. I would think that something like this has more of a right to be on that list than a, than a subpar album by a genius artist. I yeah, guess yeah. I, th- I mean I guess based on what, you're, what you've told us – you know, and learning about the band that definitely have a historical influence, right. In terms of importance and, and influencing other artists. I just wonder if there's a better, well, I don't know. Is this band representative yes. of Brazilian music in the sixties? Yeah, this is, this is like the quintessential Tropicalia Brit- uh, Brazilian artist band. Yes. I mean, okay. there, there were guys, like I said, like uh, Gilberto Gil and, um, and Veloso. They were more traditional. Who were the, or... Well, they were, they, I don't know if they, they didn't stick around as much. I mean, they actually, you know, they actually ended up getting arrested. That was another thing that was happening at this time that people were just getting arrested or, you know, imprisoned. A lot of people in the Tropicalia musical movement by the, by the government, they were just being put away. Mm-hmm. So those guys, Gil and Veloso were arrested. They weren't charged with anything. They just put them in a prison for three months and then they put them on house arrest. And then the government forced them to leave the country until 1972. So yeah. when they when they left the country, they hung out with people like, you know, um, you know, Charlie Watts from the Rolling Stones, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. You know, they did some stuff with the Whalers, you know, so they were kind of all over the place. And they really, you know, um, you, you know, kind of explored a variety of different musical genres and, and are we're still around, I believe, to this day. But 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 from what I read, Uj Mutantes was kind of the quintessential rock band, Brazilian rock band, if you will. Mm. Yeah. 